Good morning. I just took a picture of the audience to show Shashi how disappointed they are. <laughs> but I hope that at the end of the talk, you are not totally disappointed. Um, it's not uh, every day it happens that Hydra gets more importance than Drosophila. So I'm very happy about this. So I'm talking about this organism called Hydra. And you see King Hercules killing the uh, demon in the Greek mythology, Hydra. That is because it's a multi-headed monster. So when you cut a Hydra vertically, uh, when you take a slight cut, it develops two heads. If you take two cut, it develops four heads and so on. So it gets its name from, a, uh, from Greek mythology. But I can assure you that it's a very beautiful animal. There is nothing uh, bad about it. So uh, just to introduce the system, we don't have too much time today. But these are how these are the hydra that are in the lab. These are live hydra. They are about one and a half centimeters in length, uh, tubular structure, and uh, they are diploblast. Unlike us, they have only ectoderm and endoderm, as is shown here. And there are about 20 to 25 different types of cells. Unlike us, where we have about 200 types of cells. So there, are, there is less complexity of structure. Uh, but it's a very successful organism, has been around for, uh, for 600 million years. So I guess in spite of its so-called shortcomings in structure and function, it has been very, very successful. Hydra uh, also escapes organismal aging. So it doesn't necessarily die. And that, so we can discuss this later. I'm sure there will be some questions about this. And this is basically because of the three stem cell populations that are present in Hydra. One is the ectodermal epithelial stem cell population. The other is the endodermal epithelial stem cell population, which is shown here. And when they terminally differentiate these cells, they end up in the tentacles and the basal disc. Essentially, cells in the ectoderm and endoderm, which are of epithelial kind, are both somatic cells as well as stem cells. So they can uh, you know, divide and continue to multiply. There is a third stem cell population called eye cells, which are present in the body column. And these eye cells give rise to all the other cell types in Hydra, which includes uh, four types of nematocytes, the stinging cells, which is a characteristic feature of this phylum, along with, you know, in uh, corals and uh, jellyfish. It has sensory and ganglionic neurons, and it has gland and mucus cells. But in addition to that, while Hydra usually reproduces by asexual means by budding, it also can go for sexual reproduction under certain conditions, in which case these eye cells can also produce the gametes. So it's a really multipotent stem cell population. And these cells in the middle of the body column are believed to continuously migrate to the two extremities of the body. As they migrate, they also differentiate, carry out the function. In an about 20 days, they are sloughed off from the two extremities. And that is why this, this is kind of trade milling of cells, as you see in actin microfilaments or uh, tubulin microtubules. And therefore, I guess uh, the entire organism per se doesn't get old. Okay? And it has caught the imagination of biologist basically because of its regenerative ability. So if you cut hydra into three pieces, for example, all the three pieces will uh, regenerate their lost parts. You can cut it into several pieces also. And in recent years, people have shown that you can continuously disaggregate the cells of the hydra. And even a pellet, which is of about 100 to 200 cells, can regenerate into an entire hydra. So it's an excellent model system for uh, studying various biological phenomena. We started Hydra Biology in MSS Agarkar Research Institute, which is a DST institute about 20 years back. I had used it in, the, in my PhD days when Professor Shutosh Mukherjee in JNU used Hydra and sponges. After that, the system was kind of lost, and we thought that to answer certain questions in developmental biology, this would be a usable model system. So we, there have been two projects, main projects in the lab. One is about cell signaling in Hydra a little bit about which I spoke in the last meeting at uh, Ahmedabad. But today I'm going to speak about DNA repair, uh, sorry. DNA repair in Hydra. There are other projects that we have followed, but uh, we'll go into that uh, some other time. So uh, sometime back, uh, we observed that if we expose the, uh, expose the pieces of Hydra, 
to UV radiation, in some cases we found that the middle piece of hydra gives ectopic feet and this was a very surprising phenotype that we got. In about one third of the treated pieces, we got uh, ectopic uh, feet, which was obviously interfering with uh, morphogenesis. However, uh, my collaborator, Saroj Gaskarbi, who worked at Pune University, she has just retired, was interested in DNA repair and so we decided to start a small project on DNA repair in Hydra. In the year 2000, there was not a single paper or a single study on DNA repair in Hydra. So what we did was, to begin with, uh, this is just a brief introduction to DNA repair. You have the simple DNA repair systems and the complex DNA repair systems. And what we have done over the last few years is to identify certain genes and proteins which participate in the a nucleotide excision repair, where mainly the XP genes are present. So we find that all the XP genes from XPA to X, through XPG are present in Hydra. Not only that, uh, cocaine syndrome A and cocaine syndrome B, CSA, CSB, are also present in Hydra. Some of these we have characterized, and I will give you a flavor of this work. So to begin with, we decided to find out whether UV-induced DNA repair is uh, sorry, DNA damage is repaired in Hydra, and by using you know uh, uh, TT dimer antibody, we found that UV induced DNA repair is induced. Uh, sorry, uh, DNA damage is indeed repaired in about 72 hours completely, almost 100 percent. So that was the first experiment that we did, and later on we decided to characterize a couple of them because that was the only time that was uh, available to us. So the first XP gene that we looked for was XPF, which is, as you know, 5' prime endonuclease in the NER pathway, and it is very, very important for the uh, DNA repair in the nucleotide excision pathway. You, uh, there are several things that are given. These were given basically for the students. Uh, these are some of the basic things about XPF. So XPF is a very important molecule in uh, nucleotide NER. So what we did was, to begin with, a student in the lab, Apurva, uh, started looking for XPF in Hydra, which, as I told you, was, nothing was known about it. And we did find a sequence in which we have the bipartite uh, uh, NLS there, nucleotide localization signal, and also the ERCC domain, which is important for XPF function. And when she compared the sequences and the 3D structures with human, uh, nucleotide uh, ERCC domain, she found a lot of uh, similarities between them. Now, I must mention it here that most of the genes and proteins in Hydra over the years have been found to have more similarities with their vertebrate counterparts than with their invertebrate counterparts and we don't have any explanation for that. So such genes in Drosophila and worm are quite different but they are very similar to their vertebrate counterparts. So we see a lot of similarity between the hydra and the human protein. To find out its possible function, what we did was, what Apurva did was separated the ectoderm and endodermal layer. So uh, let me mention it here that hydra, because it replaces its cells all the time, there are very few mutants in hydra. There are very it's very difficult to make transgenic hydra. So we have to use certain measures which are sort of indirect. So when she isolated ectoderm and endoderm and looked for the expression of XPF, she found that it is predominantly present in the ectoderm. Uh, I mentioned initially that the eye cells that are important for giving rise to most of the body cells of hydra other than epithelial cells reside in the ectoderm in the body column. And we could clearly see that ectoderm is more enriched with, with uh, XPF transcripts. Uh, and you can see here by whole mount in situ hybridization, the XPF is expressed in the body column, but it is not expressed in the extremities. So here is what I showed you in the last slide. It is predominantly expressed in the ectoderm. After that, Apurva isolated the different cells, ectodermal, endodermal, and eye cells, and she could actually demonstrate that it is present predominantly in the eye cells. So we believe that it's very important because eye cells are the ones which also give rise to the gametes, and maybe it is important to have a robust DNA repair system here. 
although there are very few mutants in hydra there is one that we could get our hands on and that mutant so, so usually we maintain hydra at 18 degree centigrade in the lab please appreciate that hydra are present even here in the ponds they survive at 45 50 degree centigrade but in the lab all over the world they are maintained at 18 degree centigrade with 12 hour light dark cycle so we also maintain them at 18 degree centigrade so there is a mutant in hydra which if you keep at 28 degree centigrade all the eye cells are damaged so it essentially becomes an epithelial hydra and what we see there is that in this hydra also if you grow it at 18 uh, maintain it at 28 degree centigrade we get reduction in the xpf xpf expression so we believe that xpf is predominantly expressed in the uh, eye cells and as i mentioned earlier it has implications for a geno better genome maintenance in germline protection as well as a healthy asexual progeny the other gene that we looked at in the lab is the xpa protein which was looked at by another graduate student alisha and xpa is a very important molecule although it doesn't directly participate there it's crucial for damage verification step and in this case also by using very simple uh, bioinformatics tools she found that the uh, structure of the dna and rpa binding domains of the hydra xpa are very similar to the human xpa and you can see that on the after overlap you can see that they are quite similar here the predictor three dimensional structure of xpa shows that hydra xpa here is quite similar to human xenopus and drosophila xpa so uh, it's one case where drosophila xpa is also very very similar to uh, human xpa in this case what we decided to do was to collaborate with a scientist in osaka university and to see whether this hydra xpa is while it is structurally conserved is it also functionally conserved and for that we collaborated and expressed hydra xpa in xpa deficient human cell lines okay so human xpa deficient human cell lines cannot repair their dna and therefore they die when exposed to uv what we did was we actually transfected them with hydra xpa and in some cases like for example in these two clones we found that hydra can partially complement the human xpa cells so it shows that it's not only structurally similar to human counterparts but it actually rescues xpa deficient cells from dna damage induced by uv this is the master control in which if you transfect these cells with human xpa itself you get almost 100% of protection but with the hydra 2 you get partial complementation and that was quite uh, uh, exciting for us the two helicases that hydra has we have also characterized them to some extent and these are the xpb and xpd which have the uh, you know helicoids domains the standard structure with uh, uh, all the essential parts here i'm not going into that but i can discuss with others uh, discuss with uh, students and as shown earlier they also show a lot of similarity with their human counterparts again uh, we ex tried to express them in uh, human def uh, human cells which are xp d and xp b deficient but we didn't get any rescue by the way before doing that we actually did the helicase assay for both of them and you can see here that both of them actually have activity uh, when uh, dna is un unwound okay so it is functional we actually expressed i mean did the assay in vitro and also expressed it in human cells but unlike xpa xpb and xpd could not rescue or could not complement then in the third and the last part uh, i will talk about the base excision repair which is done by yet another phd so there are three phd students who worked on this that was komal who worked with worked at pune university with saroj gaskar b and there as you know there are several there are several enzymes which are important like glyco dna glycosylase ap endonuclease exonuclease dna polymerase and so on but we looked at ap1 that is the uh, apurinic a pyrimidinic endonuclease 1 and that is because it was known that ap 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 ap1 in humans has two domains so what 
people have shown is that APE1 from hum humans have a nuclear nucleus localization. It has a redox activity domain and it has a repair activity. So this is seen only in mammals and people have predicted that this enzyme evolved for the first time in mammals. Similar enzymes with certain changes in nucleotide bases are seen in zebra fish and uh, uh, some other vertebrates, but th the redox domain there is not functional apparently because the three cysteines which are important for the redox activity of the enzyme are not present in those animals. However, if you uh, induce mutations and introduce cysteines there, even the zebra fish APE1 would have redox activity. So it's a very interesting thing that no vertebrate or obviously no invertebrate has ever been reported to have APE1. So out of a whim and you know getting students to work with Hydra was always very difficult because you don't get uh, you know mutants, you don't get nice uh, in situs and all that, it's a, it's a struggle. So this girl Komal uh, agreed to look at APE1 in Hydra and actually she did find uh, uh, predicted sequence of APE1 from two Hydra species. So in this case the Hydra species that we usually work with is Hydra vulgaris, we have identified it in uh, you know, India, uh, but there is also another strain of the same species which has been being used for several decades called as Hydra magni papillata. So in this case, Komal used both Hydra magni papillata and Hydra vulgaris and she found that both of them seem to have the AP1 sequence. And you can see these are the important cysteines that are present, uh, 67, yeah, 65, 91 and 99, these are the cysteines which are important for the redox activity. In Hydra, uh, because it doesn't have these two amino acids here, it is uh, 60, 63, 91 and 97. Okay, so these three cysteines are important which are missing from any other organism, but Hydra seems to have them. So the next question was to find out whether it is really active enzyme. So the first thing that Komal did was to look for its endonuclease activity. And you can see clearly that it does show its endonucleic activity. As you can see here, substrate is digested into product. You can see the, this is human, uh, magni papillata and vulgaric. So it is very comparable activity to uh, human AP1. And you know, certain inhibitors were also used just to make sure that it's a specific enzymatic activity. And you can see that three enzymes, all the three enzymes from the three different species are actually inhibited by the enzyme activity. The next question was to find out whether redox activity is also present and by using a large scale MSA assays, she actually showed that uh, it does have redox activity. So what we essentially do is we reduce the AP1 with uh, DTT and then see whether uh, there is a uh, retardation of movement of uh, you know, DNA and that's what we find. So to summarize this, uh, and we also did that for the three mutants, uh, 97, 91, and 63. In this case, what we found that if we mutate uh, uh, Hydra AP1, all this was done by Komal, uh, then you can see reduced activity in when cysteine 63 is mutated to uh, A, C to A uh, conversion. So, that cysteine seems to be important even in Hydra for the redox activity. By using a you know, specific inhibitor of uh, the redox activity, we could show that in both um, Vulgaris and Magni Papillata, the activity goes on reducing. So it does respond to the specific inhibitor which is used as a standard inhibitor for human AP1 activity. And uh, also in the mutant as you can see, uh, this is the wild type Hydra uh, Magni papillata vulgaris, these are the controls, mock and vector, and you can see that with the three mutations, uh, C65, C91, and C97, you know, these activities are reduced. So Hydra does have an APE1, which is, which has both the redox and the uh, 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 enzyme domain, DNA repair domain. And this, uh, we have published in DNA repair and this is the only organism other than mammals which seems to show. Uh, that doesn't mean that there are no other organisms having this but people have just not looked at it. So Komal also expressed this protein uh, and then we made antibodies against that polyclonal antibodies in 
with the help of Arvind Sahu in NCCS Pune. And you can see that uh, this is in-situ hybridization of uh, APE1. This is the uh, sense control, which shows no staining. So it is present in the middle of the body column, as you can see with the antibody also. These are confocal pictures here. And it is predominantly present in the body column. Uh, and uh, what's important to note, and I'm sure you are not able to see this, but I can assure you that while this is the control, when you treat this with H2O2 or MMS, one is for redox activity, the other is for DNA damage activity. And you can see enhanced expression of this protein, especially in the uh, body column cells, which express uh, AP1. When uh, we treated it with AP1 inhibitor 3, you can see that there is uh, some effect on the overall morphology. There is some standard assay to you know, quant semi-quantify this in Hydra, and you can see that with increasing concentrations of H2O2, uh, uh, not increasing with time, increasing time, H2O2 and MMS induce more and more abnormalities. So when we work on Hydra, we always try to correlate whatever we see in the gels or in the append of tubes or in the organism. So that's the idea. And that is the part where students are not terribly happy because they are happy running hundreds of gels, but unhappy doing in situ hybridization with the whole organism. Uh, and if we use inhibitor of uh, endonuclease activity, we don't see any effect on regeneration. But if you use the redox activity, then you see that regeneration is affected. And there are other papers which, that have come from Saroj Gaskarbi's lab, which show that uh, antioxidant activity is essential. So redox signaling is in essential for regeneration. So you can see here that with increasing concentration of the inhibitor here, you can see reduced regeneration capacity in Hydra. So we now believe, uh, and this is what we have done so far, uh, we have looked at Hydra XPA genes. Some of them have been characterized. Other we have identified, uh, but we have not been able to characterize them. And we think there are, these are important not only in NER, but there are some um, you know, uh, XP proteins which have been also implicated in some diseases like progeria or even developmental abnormalities. And we would have liked to look at them, but I don't know, somebody else might take it up. Then we, uh, it has a robust DA, a BR activity also. AP1 we have looked at, but we have not been able to look at others. In collaboration with Satish Raghavan in IIC Bangalore, we have also looked at certain other pathways, and we find that the non-homologous end joining is present in Hydra. Unfortunately, that work is not uh, complete enough to be presented in this forum. So, so far, to my knowledge, these are the only papers on DNA repair in Hydra, and I am very perplexed that why people have been not looking at it, because it has tremendous regeneration ability, and most uh, importantly, it tends to escape organismal aging, and people have not really looked at uh, DNA repair here. So whatever I told you is based on these seven publications that we have had, and these three theses, Apurva Barwe, uh, Alisha Galande, and Komal Pekle. So just for this, I mean, anyone wants to read more on this, this is a general article on Hydra. It's an interesting model that one can use for short projects as well as long projects. This has come in resonance some time back. Our cell signaling work has been uh, so reviewed in International Journal of Development Biology and the DNA repair work in Frontiers in Genetics. So Apurva did the main work, to, to, uh, big, began the work, XPF and XPA, Alisha did XPA, XPB and XPD, and Komal, who worked at Pune University, did the AP1 work. Uh, we collaborated with Ma uh, Masafumi Saijo for expressing the XPA genes in human XP, uh, XPA genes in human XP deficient cells. Uh, Dr. Tell from uh, uh, Udin University confirmed the results with AP1 regarding its uh, DNA activity as well as the redox activity. Saroj, of course, because she was interested in DNA repair, I was coaxed, I was actually pushed, uh, I was. Uh, blackmailed into doing DNA repair and that has come very useful for me and I'm very thankful for her. Unfortunately, she's not here. She would have presented this work much better than me. Thomas Bosch from Keel University, who's a established Hydra biologist, helped us initially when we established Hydra lab here and which was very, very tough that time. 
uh, Makoto Sashima, we have collaborated with him to express human vertebrate developmental genes in xenopus embryos, where also we show that certain genes like Noggin have been functionally conserved. Satish Raghavan, as I mentioned, we have been working for non-homologous enjoining technique. And Arvind Sahu helped us uh, isolate, purify, and express the AP pro one protein and make antibodies. This is Agarkar Research Institute, which is a DST institute. The work was done in collaboration with Agarkar and uh, Pune University. And these have been the funders over the years. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. There's one here. Very good morning, sir. Thank you very much for the nice work. Thank you. Uh, sir, I was wondering regarding the nuclear localization signal. Did you check uh, the importing proteins? Sorry? Did you check the role of importing protein? No, we didn't. Okay. Uh, because uh, importing protein uh, played a role for the Yeah, we have not been able to do that Could so far. Yeah. Nice it has a bipartite signal, but yeah. we have not looked at it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Uh, you were saying if you take a small fragment of Hydra, like about 200 cells or so, they can still regenerate. I was wondering if you can take uh, some cells and uh, let's say a centrifuge or something to get the orientation away, make it home, give them the opportunity to realign and develop, will they become a Hydra again? Yes. So, uh, not only small fragments, actually you make a pellet of the cells. And even a 200, 100 cell pellet can make a hydra. So what we usually believe from the work of Louis Walpert, especially, is that it has gradients. You know, that's what he used for a positional information and morphogen gradients. But it turns out that even in, in this uh, pellet, you know, certain cells, groups of cells start expressing wind to begin with, wind gene. And then finally, only one of the groups uh, keeps on expressing wind and that becomes the head of hydra. So although you ruin all the morphogen gradients and positional information there, because that's what we have been taught. In fact, Walpert got that idea because if you cut it into, let's say, three pieces, yes, yes. head will always come on the side where original head was there. That is because of the gradients. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can happen even in the pellet. So this is a pellet centrifuged. Right. So you can just keep a pellet and it will regenerate. Yeah, so you can go on yeah. studying many processes. Yeah. Oh, hi, Shashi. Question from the examiner. Huh? So, um, I can't. The, yeah. This, you know, AP1 is there in Hydra and in mammals. Yes. So, I think we are losing you in between. What is the phylogenetic root? Is it? So we don't know because AP1 is present in all organisms, okay? No, no, that, that redox but the redox is. domain is present only in the mammal, I mean functional only in the mammals. The interminal domain, which is the redox domain, is present in other vertebrates. But it is non-functional because the cysteines which are required are not present. So it's there. a convergence. We, uh, yeah, we have no idea. So that's why uh, evolutionary biologists should tell us what's happening. 